latest Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Ido Leffler, one of the co-founders of yes Two carrots Some of the big lessons and challenges they overcame. He talks about what was a major crisis he thought would kill the company. He also talks about what he would well up with tears thinking about and how at one point he thought he grew too big, too fast, and what advice did he give that his wife actually told him. That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I'm excited to have Ido Leffler. Ido, welcome. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you. Ido is the co-founder of Yes2. They launched an international, you know, they launched internationally at the end of 2006, and Yes2 products, which is Yes2 carrots, cucumbers, tomatoes, blueberries. Blue bit. Blueberries, grapefruit, baby Great. carrots. It sounds delicious, but it, it's sold today in over 25,000 retail points, over 24 countries. It's a number two natural beauty brand in the US and can be found in Walgreens, Target, Walmart, CBS, Kroger, Bed Bath, Whole Foods. If I kept going on, it'd probably take the whole interview time. But um, he's also coming out with his book, Get Big Fast and Do More Good, which I have will put on my Audible wish list for sure. And Ido, thanks for spending the time today. Oh, my absolute pleasure. This is going to be a lot of fun. Now, we want to learn your most valuable lessons. And, you know, oftentimes we learn our biggest lessons when there's mistakes we've made and you've overcome a lot. You know, people hear this story and they, you know, this was not easy to do. All right. And before I, you know, we talk about some of the lessons learned, I always like to include a fun fact. And a fun fact about Ido is he's absolutely obsessed with the West Wing. And he's convinced me to probably watch every season uh, in the next two weeks. So no, I, I, I think I'm Aaron Sorkin's biggest fan. It's, <laughs> it's a little bit scary. Um, so tell me about the early days of the company. What was one of the big lessons or mistakes that you learned from early on? I, I think early on, what we did, which um, a lot of companies do, is you, you you tend to get very caught up in the hype of, of your company. And we grew way too f- big, way too fast. Now, our book is called Get Big Fast and Do More Good, so we're all about getting big fast, but there's, there's, you've got to be measured. And what we ended up doing was we ended up launching, um, I think in the first 18 months, 10 countries. Um, we'd launched in 5,800 stores in the US, and we didn't have the resources or the capacity or the people to really help do that justice. So I, I think... It's important to grow fast. You've just got to be very wary of what your what resources you're going to need for that. And we found ourselves sometimes whether it was lack of personal resources, sometimes it was lack of financial resources. And um, fortunately, I, I when we started the company, I, I didn't have hair. But had I had a lot of hair, um, <laughs> it would be all gone at that point. So tell for people who don't know, when you say launch, what were some of the products that you launched with? So we launched um, six products in 16 stores in this small little country. You may have heard of it. It's called Israel. Um, it, and, and we just launched just your basics, your day cream, your night cream, things like your, your, your six most basic products. When we launched in the U.S., um, we launched with 16 products. So it was Yes to Carrots was our first line, which was our, our call it the big sister of the lot. And... It was created primarily to help nourish your skin, and it was a natural product that was designed for a mass audience. Yeah. So when you go from those to the 16 stores, right, and then you grow exponentially, how do you, you know, it almost seems insurmountable to even fulfill that. Oh, God. It, it, when we first got that first order, it was the greatest news we've ever had and the worst news we've ever had because we found out in, in one afternoon, I remember walking out and my business partner says to me, I called him up, it would have been three in the morning in, in, uh, in, in Australia where he was sleeping and I said, look, Lance, I've got good news and I've got bad news. He goes, what's the good news? I said, well, the good news is we've just got 
listings in 5,800 Walgreens stores, 16 products. The bad news is we have to get it all there in the next few months. And we ran around giving what I could only describe as 10 I have a dream speeches to our the manufacturing partners. And then finally had, a, had to give a real um, big, big spiel to the Israel's national carrier, which is Elal, to convince, to give us, at the time, two 767 aircrafts to ship the stock because we didn't have time to put it on a boat. So we did... How do you even do that? Because Israel, out of all the countries too, are very strict. Oh, it's... It, you know what? I think one of my mentors and and and... I've learned this, he said, you know, in life and in business, um, it's it's 20% the hard work and, and your your brains and the work that you do and 80% good old fashioned luck. And I think we were, we had a combination of those two. We knocked on the right doors. We, people could see in our eyes. And I think that's a big difference between starting a business, which is just about making a dollar and, and, and starting a business which you're emotionally connected to. And people could see in my eyes, I would well up with, with tears um, at just the thought of not being able to get this done. So people could see that they were, if they weren't going to help me, I was going to find somebody else that could. And thankfully, we were surrounded by amazing, positive people who gave us a shot. I mean, how did you even get to, because again, you're at that point, a smaller company. How do you even get to a 747? So I, you, you, what's really funny is that I didn't have an appointment when I went to that meeting. So we got we got an order for what was going to be five thousand eight hundred Walgreens stores. We, um, we we finally convinced people to manufacture all the raw materials and everything needed to get that done in the time needed. And the only thing missing was that was how the hell we were going to get it from the from. That's from a big. What, that's a big problem. Yeah, so, so here I was, an Australian guy. Oh, I was born in Israel, grew up in Australia. Walking into, um, I, I walked straight into the Alal headquarters and asked to speak to the person in charge of freight. It was that simple. You know, had I had written an email, nobody I think would have responded to me. They would have thought, who is this crackpot writing to us? And I walked in there, I was in jeans, a shirt, um, you know, I, 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 and, and I, they just pointed me in the right direction and I walked in there and uh, the rest is history. That's great. So what were some of the other, later on, what were some of the other big uh, lessons or mistakes that you really learned from and took home? I think, and uh, you know, one of the things that was really important to us as we grew and, and uh, we went through a major crisis in the company, which is it was a major <clears throat> product control issue that really I thought was going to to kill the company, and and so we did everything humanly possible to fix it. And at the time, I was the CEO of the company, and and we, I was running around the world, and I neglected a large part of what this company was about, which is about this positive, exciting culture that we had built internally at the time. And we, our headquarters, we had moved at that point to San Francisco. And I remember coming back, and I remember seeing on my desk there was a handwritten letter. And I, I opened the letter, and I looked at it, and, and inside was a letter from one of our staff, and someone who was, at the time, he wasn't even a direct report to me. He was a little bit further down. He was in our finance team. And the letter said, Dear Ido, you know, I hope um, this email doesn't offend you in any way and you know that this is going to be a bad email. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, and it said, but you've let me down. You've disappointed me. I joined this company because I believed in your mission, your vision, your dream, your positive nature, your, your, what this brand stood for. Um, and over the past month or so since we've had this crisis, we, the whole office is down because they sense your mood, they sense you being down and, and everything else. And 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 I, and I and I had to sit back and, you know, my initial response was in my head was, you know, how dare he, doesn't he know that I'm trying to save the company and everything else. And then I sort of really looked into it and went, you know what, he's right. I I got too much into the the stuff that I, I A, am not the best at, B, don't enjoy doing. And as a result, I... I I was letting my team down, the, the company down, and our customers down effectively. So at that point, I made a decision that 
I did no longer wanted to be the CEO of the company. I wanted to be the founder and the face and, and, and the person who um, could really set the, the vision and, and culture of what we were doing. And, um, and, and that, that single letter by a, 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 a good friend by a guy called Brian changed the course of my um, career and probably changed the course of how I, I, I live my life. That's great. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. What specifically did you realize that you weren't good at at that point? Well, I, I, I had known for a while that I, I'm not I definitely I'm not the greatest guy when it comes to the details of the numbers and the forecasting and the um you know, putting together um sales plans. I I'm the guy I love taking people for dinner. I love flying around the world and meeting people for the first time and telling them the story about what we were about. I love coming up with PR plans and, and marketing strategies and tactics and I love that. That's the thing that I'm good at. There are but there are people in the world who are fantastic at, at running, you know, companies and running the the the, the intricate details of, of what needs to be done, of setting forecasts, of getting all these things done, which is critical to a success of a business. And yeah. I think what a lot of founders um, don't do is, or, or they don't realize, or they realize it too late, is that they are not the best at everything. No one is the best at everything. Yeah. And, and and so for me, I'd realize that I I I I was very open about my failings and was willing to embrace them. So what do you do at that point? Because it's again, it's your baby. You've created this company. How do you? What do you do next? You take a leap of faith. Um, and more than anything, I, I took a leap of faith. I, I, we, we went around, I, I, I consulted with my business partner and with our board and with our investors and let them know that this is how I was feeling. And um, we went about finding the polar opposite of me, somebody who could do these things, who enjoyed doing the things that I was not good at and, and didn't necessarily um, go the other way in terms of that didn't necessarily conflict with what I'm doing. And... We've, we found her. She's an amazing, uh, in, in, in a woman by the name of Joy Chen. She's an incredible CEO. She's actually was named CEO of the year here in San Francisco oh, wow. this year. And, you know, we found someone who completely complimented me that we, tr you know, we have a philosophy at Yes2 where we don't employ people. We adopt people. So we brought her in. She became part of the family from day one. We gave her all the trust in the world and she's proven to be an amazing partner. That's great. What, a, you know, you seem to have that positive i mean the, the whole name of the company is positive we, yeah. and you know fighting through these challenges is not easy what were what do you think on when times are low what was something that influenced you when you were growing up you know i, I grew up in a family that, that we immigrated from um uh, we, we, we immigrated from um Aust from israel to australia when i was four years old and it was an amazing um transition for me as a as a as a child to come into a into a country where we virtually knew nobody we and to see my family flourish in that environment we did exceptionally well we were very lucky we were you know very successful immigrants but um unfortunately the the sad part of the story is that at some point my family lost everything that we had built and well, to see how my family unit you know, got together my brother my parents how we all you know combined together as a unit and my parents who, who I remember sit, they sat us down in, in their car I, they were picking me up from school and my dad announced to us that we we had just lost everything that we'd built over those years wow. um, and but he's you know he, he you could tell in his eyes that you know that he was devastated and we turned around as a collective family unit and said, don't worry, we'll do it again and we'll do it together. And so that was a big grow up fast moment for me. Yeah. And, um, but even in the lowest of times, my parents were still upbeat, positive, good people and happy people. And my entire, you know, my dad's, um, my dad's philosophy of this is, life is a marathon it's not a sprint you, you, you gotta you you gotta go you gotta you you go with the good and the bad you've got to drink you've got to relax you've got to take time and you gotta you know in the end of the day if something's not right about your life 
you are the person who's empowered to make that change. So I prefer to look at things um, as not just being, you know, glass half full. I want I'm looking I look at things as though the glass is overflowing and you know, you've got to enjoy everything and every opportunity that life gives you and because the simple question is why the hell not? <laughs> yeah. You know, you get to do this once and we're all reminded of it, you know, with with either losing loved ones or or hearing about tragedies of, about yeah. people losing their lives too soon and you know it's very easy to, to 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 look at that for one day or two days and then kind of go back to your regular life but hey what if you could embrace that every day yeah that's true and you know obviously your dad and your family are you know big influences and mentors what other good piece of advice you've gotten from uh, a mentor that's been valuable uh, to you i i think um probably the it's kind of funny, but my wife's a little bit of a mentor. Um, she sat me down and when we were still dating and said to me, it op and it was less of a statement that she said and it was more of an action that she took. And she said, you know, if we're going to survive as a, as a partnership, as in a relationship, what I'm going to need some time. And what that meant was, um, at the time I was coming into the I was coming into the house at 7 p.m. I'd usually be on a call. I'd give her a kiss on the cheek, walk to my study, and then see her at like 11 o'clock when I was exhausted and tired and just want to go to bed. And she, we, we basically created this rule in our home that from 7 p.m. till 9 p.m. we switch off. And that's now extended from 7 till way later, and and you know, and certain days. It could be the whole day, but the, but that whole notion of not having uh, that, uh, of having time, not having the appendage of your phone or your email yeah. on you, has has changed also how I look at my life, and it's become you know it's become part of my daily ritual. Yeah. So when I email her this interview when it goes live, you're gonna get huge browning points for that one. Oh right. no, that's the that's the only reason why I just mentioned that. <laughs> I, 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 I I may or may not get lucky. Too. Okay, good. <laughs> um, what's the best piece of advice that you'd have for a business owner right now that you know maybe they're just starting out, maybe they're they just want to grow the company? What would you tell them? You know, I I think the the number one piece of advice I can tell anybody is that believe in if you truly truly believe in what you're building and that's you've got to really look at yourself in the mirror and truly believe that this is what is your calling or what is going to be the, the solution for you or your family or whatever it's going to be but what you're building is truly amazing surround yourself with as many positive human beings as possible that can help you drive that thing write down the list who are the 10 people that are the most important to help you drive that and this is going to sound a little bit harsh but anybody who's going to stop you achieving that drop them and you know you, they can still be a friend I'm not saying don't you know if they've been your friend for the past 25 years don't you know say hey you're no longer my friend but you know talk to them about golf talk to them about you know your vacations don't talk to them about business only the people that you talk to about your business surround yourself with people that are going to be you know, whether it's positive um, you know constructive criticisms okay but Surrounding yourself with people that can really help you build your dream because that's one of the great things and I think it's been one of our most successful um, or one of the most biggest reasons for our success is that we've surrounded ourselves with a group of people and a community of people that care about us being successful and vice versa. Yeah. And um, that positivity drives you to do things that you never thought you would ever do. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I have one last question. And before I ask it, I want you just to tell us a little bit more about your business. What's exciting now? Tell us about the new book coming out. So, yeah, yes, too. We're having a, an incredible year. It, we've got a whole bunch of new products. We just um, launched our Yester Grapefruit line, which I'm really excited about. And a whole, there's so many new products coming out. It, it's phenomenal. Our team's 
the, the most incredible group of people in San Francisco. It, it's just phenomenal, the diverse and exciting range of people that we've now got working for years too. And that's something that I'm really excited about. And on a personal note, I'm just so excited for the book, uh, you know, get big fast and do more good. The, the whole concept of the book is, you know, starting your business, make it huge and, and, and change the world. And the, the, the basic premise of the book is if these two schmucks can do it, you can too. Um, you know, I think you're very modest with that, but okay. You know, we were definitely not the smartest kids in the room. We were we, in the classroom. We were just we're just guys that had a vision, a, a mission, and, and a passion to make it happen. And and our book, more than anything, is just a funny read yeah. um, that will show you that you can really do this too. You just got to apply some very basic principles, and 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 anybody can do it. Whether it's in business, in your career, regardless of what it is, anybody can do it. Yeah, and that's great. I'm definitely going to check it out, and everyone should. And you're just a good storyteller, so I know it's going to be wonderful. Um, so I had two last questions. One is, um, you know, part of the giving back part is you donate proceeds to Seed Fund. Yes. Right. So tell people what Seed Fund is. Um, so, so the Seed Fund is a incredible organization that we set up. It was actually my wife's idea. Effectively, we plant um, organic fruit and vegetable gardens um, in throughout the United States, and they're teaching gardens to teach mm -hmm. kids where their food comes from. And then we have feeding gardens, which we call micro farms, through our program Yes to Hope, where we feed now over 10,000 kids in Kenya and Tanzania. And we plant these incredible micro farms around their schools, hmm. um, and to see to see what these kids in these communities can do with 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 what we've been able to provide for them, it, it's it's life changing when you see it. It's I, I'm so excited every time I go visit. It's it, it makes you just believe in 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 this world being such an incredible place. Yeah, yeah, and we'll link that up too, so people can check that out. My last question is, I don't know if it's a personal question, but you know, you grew up in a real positive entrepreneurial household. Um, what do you do with your kids, or will will you do with your kids to kind of foster that creativity and spirit? You know, for all parents out there, including myself. Uh, you know, that's the, the first and foremost is spend time with your kids. I think that's that that's the biggest win. The other thing is, um, don't be afraid to put your kids on a plane. Our kids travel with us all over the world. My, my four-year-old's seen more of the world than I think most people see in their entire lifetime. So is my two-year-old for that matter. Um, and that whole notion of... I think that the biggest gift my parents gave me is the fact that I never... F I treated everybody the same. My parents always treated everybody the same, whether they were the CEO of a major corporation, a celebrity, or, or, or anybody. Um, and you know, as and I grew up when I grew up, I was a checkout clerk at a local supermarket. Um, you know, you never know who you're going to be meeting or talking to or, or who they are, and you should treat everybody the same. And and as a result, um, I teach my kids and I bring my kids to meetings. I bring my kids to meet these incredible people. I introduce them to wonderful people, so they grow up understanding that everybody's the same and if you treat everybody the same with the same level of respect and with the same level of courtesy you you no longer have the fear or apprehension when you meet somebody new regardless of who they are and that's a huge powerful tool and, and I hope that my kids um, are able to, to you know meet leaders of countries and feel that they are um, and talk to them just like they would their next door neighbor yeah. yeah, I love it, Ido. Thank you so much for spending the time. I look forward to the book. And uh, everyone, check out Yes Too and uh, try out their, their carrots, cucumbers, and, and everything else. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Cheers.